Hello, welcome to episode 30 of Take Care of Yourself with Tara and Jolie. Today, we are going to be talking about a book that I read uh, this past week, which is What I Was Doing While You Were Breeding by Kristen Newman. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Take Care of Yourself with Tara and Jolie. I'm Jolie and this is my friend Tara. Hi! Hey, and so the book that we're talking about is What I Was Doing While You Were Breeding, a memoir by Kristen Newman. She's a television writer who's worked for ho in Hollywood for nearly 20 years. So she's written for That 70s Show, Chuck, How I Met Your Mother, and The Neighbors. And this is her story of basically what she was doing in her late 20s and early mid 30s basically while all her friends were getting married and having babies she did not go that route and so what she would do is this apparently the screenwriting season is like eight months like you write shows for eight months and then you have like a three month break so she would just travel to all these different countries like all over the world during those three months and she would meet men and have relationships and fall in love and then leave them and so like the whole book is kind of this not really travel but kind of travel and then not a love story but like has a lot of kind of love story relationships in it um and so yes yeah, so that's the premise of the book <laughs> so did you like it it sounds good how did you like it Yes. So I really enjoyed reading this book. It was quick. Like it was just easy. It was fun. It was like living vicariously through a person who has the exact opposite life to me in that I am everything she was afraid of. Like her, basically her parents got married young and had kids young and ended up divorcing when she was like 15 because they grew into separate people and then ended up both remarrying and her dad has this whole other family. But like, like that was my life path, right? Like I got married at 21. I had my first kid at 23, my second kid at 25. And like my life has essentially been staying in one spot raising my family um and so it was interesting to just read about this woman with this whole other life <laughs> yeah definitely it sounds super interesting I love memoirs too because they it's like they give you insight into somebody's life who could be really really different from you and you, you don't have to do anything <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but get to like see how it unfolded for them. It's so funny that you read that this week though, because after we hung up last week, we were talking about how um like me becoming a parent in my I think we have to call it late 30s now that I'm 36, uh, is really is just a totally different experience than what you had having become a parent in your early twenties and how you know, different that is. So it's awesome that she found a memoir that's like perfectly <laughs> lined up with that. Yeah. It's Fair. one of those things you do think about, like, it's not a, did I make the right decision? Did I make the wrong si decision situation? It's not that at all, but it's like that. What would my life be like? Or what kind of parent would I be like if I had waited? And I think, um, I like to like stalk authors on like Twitter and social media after I finish their books. And so I think she has a daughter with uh, the person that she is married to and she also has stepchildren. And so like, and it's weird because I don't want the purpose of the book to be like all women end up married with children, but like that was the life path she wanted. She was just like afraid of it or didn't want it too soon or felt like she needed to live life before she could find someone. And she talks a lot about like the feeling she was looking for. Like she wanted to fall in love and have it be like this all encompassing love. And so she talks about that, like explores that idea of like, what is it to fall in love with the person you're meant to be with for the rest of your life? Um, so it was interesting. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So it sounds like she talks about, um, not just her adventures, but also her, her like she is centering the idea of like eventual motherhood as like a premise. Yeah. The book. Yeah. Or maybe not motherhood, but partnerhood. Right. She definitely wants a husband. Like she is in the search of a husband 
not by traveling and like trying to find a husband. Like it, it's a complicated relationship she has with um, looking for the right person. And she talks about like failed relationships and how she's like, when she's in the States, she's one person. And when she's away, she's another person. So when she was in the States and like dating people who could potentially be her husband, like she talks about why those were maybe bad decisions. Um, it's funny if you read the Goodreads reviews of this book, um, people had very mixed feelings about it. Some people were like me and just loved it and other people didn't. And I think that's because Kristen is not a likable, and I'm putting that in quotes, female character. And by likable, I mean she doesn't fit in society's box of what women can be, should be, are allowed to say, are allowed to do with their bodies. So she, like, has feelings, and she has <laughs> sex with strangers, and, like, she doesn't feel bad about any of that. And so that would be my reasoning why some of the good reviews good reads reviews are just like ah, this book was terrible I'm like eh, I think you just didn't like that a woman was like living her life in her 30s and like not settle down <laughs> right yeah and I think some people too find uh when people write memoirs that is about like I'm afraid of this thing I want this thing I'm afraid of this thing I want this thing that kind of I am so fascinated by reading people's like decision making process is kind mm -hmm. of what you read, right? But like some people really don't like that. Like they think it's self indulgent or it's yes. like I don't want to read about it. I like that's why I read memoirs. I want to know like why you came to that decision, how you processed it, because that's how my brain is like, you know, as the questioner. <laughs> I yeah. want to know all of the logic. And I actually get disappointed in memoirs when they aren't more um, like why I decided to do this. And they're just like, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. I'm like, but, but like, did you, did you do a lot of thinking about that? <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. It's very, um, that was like one of the big criticisms or themes running through the reviews was like, it was self-indulgent. Like it was, and I'm like, it, it's a, it's a memoir. Like it's her, <laughs> it's almost like a diary, but not, um, like it's told chronologically. So it's almost like reading her diary. Um, and it's just like her retelling you, but she's like funny. Like she's a, it's not like some memoirs are like, I went on vacation and I did this and it's really boring. Like you, you don't want right. to listen, but this is right. like the most interesting stories that she has about travel. And it was just really good. Like I love adventure and traveling and I've just not done a ton of it apart from the fact that I live in a country that I was not born in which for me is like there's so much like exploring just where I live now but like I've never been to Brazil or Argentina or Amsterdam or Israel and like she's been to all these places and I like that I loved yeah so there were a few things in the book like that I picked out because it's one of those books like that you read it's it's not as deep as Eat, Pray, Love. Like, it's it's Eat, Pray, Love, but a little bit more on the, like, funny comedy side of, like, that style of book. But there were, like, little nuggets that she would drop that I was like, oh, I love that. So the first one that she talks about was something that her mom taught her, which is the idea of choosing small pain when it's going to give you great joy. And so she talks about, like, um, summer camp, like, or when you, you're at like a playground and you don't know anyone as a kid and you have to go up and like experience that small pain of like introducing yourself and not being awkward and possibly getting rejected in order to have this great reward of like new friendships. And I just love the idea of like choosing the small pain when you know it's going to lead to great things. Yes. I love that so much. I feel like that is um, one of the things that Oh, what's her name? Gretchen Rubin talks about in her happiness books is it's one of her rules of adulthood, but I can't remember what it is, but there's a way of saying it. That's like, yeah, like the small pain for the great joy is like a great way of framing it. And it's also like, and this might need to even be Gretchen Rubin. This might be something else, but make hard choices now for an easy life, like mm -hmm. hard choices. It was an easy life, but easy choices lead to a hard life, right? Like mm -hmm. if you just do the things that, that aren't uncomfortable, your life's like not going to be that great, yeah. <laughs> but you have to 
do the really hard things in order to have like a nicer, easier life. Mm -hmm. And that's funny because the next thing that I picked out from her book was she talks about that a good life is full of really hard choices because hard choices means that you are having, or, you know, can sometimes mean you are having to choose between two awesome things. And it's not a bad thing. So she talks about this like towards the end of the book when she's talking about like choosing between settle down family, husband, kids and traveling like it's okay. Like that's a really hard choice. Like it, it doesn't mean you're choosing the wrong thing because it's so hard, right? Like you're choosing between two awesome things and that should be celebrated. Like that you have these two amazing options that you love both and you're just picking like which one is the more awesome thing. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's really great. And I mean, it's those hard choices. It's like, how blessed are you to get to make those hard choices? Mm -hmm. (laughs) If you have two great options, right? If your options are settling down with a great person or traveling, that's like pretty, pretty great choices. But what's interesting is I feel like when those things come up, we think we have to get it right. Or we like, Stress that we're getting it wrong, especially in my early twenties, I did a lot of like, oh my gosh, I have to make the right decision, right? So for a long time, my decision was like grad school or starting a business, and I thought if I got it wrong, my whole life would be bad, <laughs> you know. And I also, I mean, I did debate like, okay, do I get married or do I not, and and like have a more independent life? And you just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like you got to decision. That's what like, that was kind of the conclusion of all of my big decisions in my early twenties was I was like, I finally came to realize like, I'm not going to make the right decision. I just have to make a decision. And almost everything is, is reversible. Mm-hmm. Uh, having kids is the one like really irreversible decision you're going to make, but like relationships, travel, business, grad school, I can always change any of those. Um, and just like having that knowledge, it's like, okay, well maybe it's not as big, as much pressure as I was putting on it. I was listening to a podcast this morning, um, that actually kind of touched on this and it really helped me. Cause I will admit like part of me, like a, a small, tiny part of me is like sad that I've not had the experiences that she's had, right? Like that I will, not th- Okay, I know this isn't true, but in my head, the script is like, I'll never go to Brazil and like meet this wonderful group of strangers and meet these friends who will be friends for life and travel. Like, I'm never going to have those experiences. And like, small part of me is like bummed, right? Like, my 20s were different. Um, But this podcast I was listening to, she was talking about completely different thing, but boxes, like putting everything in boxes and how we can only have one box out at a time. So like right now my box is family and kids and I love that box. Like I do, I love it. And I only get one shot at watching my kids grow up. And I, I don't want to give that box up to take down the travel box yet, but it's not like we've locked up the other boxes. I can be, have the family kids box out now. And when my kids are 18, I can put that box on the shelf and I can take out the travel box and I'll be 40 and I can spend my forties traveling around the world. Like it's okay that, you know, our, our boxes all come out at different times and we can fill them with different things, but it's like one box at a time, which I really liked that idea. I love that idea. And it's, it's, it sounds like what you what you tell kids, right? Like you can only have one box of toys at a time. Yeah. That goes out. You can't also have the whatever. Right. Like, but that um, it's so interesting because the way you framed that is like, so I didn't take my kid box off the shelf in my twenties for a bunch of reasons, but I, but like, that's the box I will most likely be in in my forties. Right. So like you will be like, come to Brazil with me. (laughs) And I'll be like, I'm right in the middle of like seven, eight, 10 year old. Right. Like it's harder to travel with them. Um, so it's like, it's so easy though, to be where we are and see what other boxes people are playing with and be like, Oh, I didn't get to do that because I made these decisions. Forgetting like, I got to point out that you took your travel box off the shelf way before most people do. Right. Yeah. You to the University of Manchester? Uh, uh, Liverpool, actually. Liverpool, okay. Uh, when you were... 18, 19, 18 19, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you went from, like, New England, like, yeah. being an American in New England and a college student to, like, being a college student in England, and then you never left England. So I'm sure to you it feels like you're very settled, but to many other people, you're, like, an expatriate, you live abroad, you have little kids with little British accents, which is, like, my favorite. <laughs> um, so, like, 
you know, you, you, you like took that box off in a big way. Yeah. And, but it, but yeah, like the going to South America or to Asia and backpacking, you didn't do, but you did make one really like adventurous decision that led to a more settled down decision. Right. And that, so I think that, so I did travel a lot. I left my house before I even turned 18 and like I moved around a lot. I lived in Boston. Um, and then I came to England. And so I think what happened is my travel box was out and I was moving places and I was loving it. And I moved to England and then I didn't consciously switch, right? Like I didn't see how settled I was becoming. And like, until like I woke up and I'm 30 and I'm like, Hey, what happened to my travel box? Like, because I, <laughs> but I know like, I, yes, I'm still living in like this country that I love. Like, I'm so happy I've ended up here. So I think it was just like realizing like, okay, like, yes, like I was traveling and then I woke up and was settled and like, but that's okay. Like I'm loving this box that I have right now and I can have that travel box back, you know, in like 10 years, which is not that long at all. <laughs> Totally. And the other thing to remember is that some people are like combining their boxes in really interesting ways, right? Like, and your, everybody's family situation and job situation will be like different and maybe allow for this or not. But like, there's a lot of people that, um, completely travel full time with their children. Yeah. Now I think that often they do this like before their kids are school age, which by the way, <laughs> traveling that much with toddlers seems so scary to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, I'll, but, um, and I know that uh, your boys like routine more, but maybe by the time they're 14 and 15, they might be more settled in themselves and more adventurous. And like, if Ian is up for, I mean, who knows where your business will be? Right. It's good. There's no reason to say for sure you have to wait till they move out. Oh yeah. Like, you know, at 13 or 14, you guys could decide like, we're going to take a year and spend like six months in Asia and six months in South America. Yeah. And would, my husband would never do that. <laughs> so like, for sure that's, um, but he doesn't care if I go spend a week or 10 days. And even after we have kids, he's like, it, it, it will be my decision if I choose to want to do that or not. But he's like totally on board because when we moved here and settled here, I was like, the only way that I can like settle here forever and not ever think about moving someplace else. Cause I always want to move other places is if I can travel whenever I want. Yeah. And he was like, Yes, I would love for you to travel as much as you want and not make me super uncomfortable by making me travel a lot. Right. And that's something, it's one of those things, I feel like we've talked about this in past episodes, about me not realizing what I want and then me not realizing I could ask for it and, like, I'm just getting there. Like, I literally am, like, that stereotypical person who, like, woke up at 30-something and was just like, whoa, like, how did I end up here? And I love that I'm here, but, like... I, I, I don't know what happened to all these things. I don't know what happened to all of these things that I used to love. I let them slip. No one else let them slip. Like I let motherhood and business building and being a wife and being like, I let that take over. But so like what I've tried to do is like, I recently went to Glasgow for four days by myself and I was just like, I need to feel adventurous and free spirited. And like, I, I need to be able to just go hang out in the beach for six hours and not have kids talking to me and like having to manage everyone else's expectations of this trip. Like, and my husband's like, go, go for it. So like that now that's something I can think of like, okay, well once a year I can take a four day trip all by myself to a new place. And like, that's okay. Like I could ask for that and it's all okay. Um, so yeah, like it's realizing, you know, what, what I need, what I want, what I miss and like asking for it and building that into our family structure now. Yeah. And I, I think that this is, this affects so many of the women I talk to, like even about having time for their business or having like hours that, um, their partner lets them totally get away and spend on it. Like so much of it is about realizing like you could ask for what you needed. And also you can like, <laughs> you can keep having the conversation, right? Right. You know, we've had conversations with women who are like, Oh, well, my partner doesn't support it or he doesn't believe in it. Or there's no way I, I do all of these things. There's no way I could do this thing I really want to do. And it's like, well, it's like the boxes, like you can, but you have to, you have to decide what you're going to trade for it. And it's okay. Like, you're allowed to trade anything and you're allowed to ask for anything and you're allowed to keep having conversations with the people in your life if you're not getting the support you need. 
But the, I think what's hard about it is a, we have these expectations that like a good mom or woman or partner will do ABC, whatever mm -hmm. that is in our head. And so we feel like by asking for something different, we're like not living up to what we should be. And then the other side of it is, is just like asking seems hard or risky or right. Like, like yeah. the could say no. So you don't really know if you should ask. And like, I just want to encourage everybody to ask for what they need all the time because you'll be surprised, right? Like you wouldn't yeah. have thought that Ian would be like, go for four days. That's fine. Right. I thought he'd be like resentful and like, why would you want to leave our family? Like you must like be this terrible wife and mother for wanting to leave us. And he's just like, no, okay, this is what you need. Like go for it. It's four days. I mean, in the, <laughs> in the hours and hours you spend with your family each day, like four days, I mean, at this point, I don't even know if your kids will remember you ever took that trip. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. when they're grown up, won't be like, mom left us. <laughs> I, right. Right. But we all have these internal stories about what it will do. And so it's so important to ask. And to, I think, like, just realize you're making a decision all the time, mm -hmm. right? Like, you woke up in your 30s, and it sounds like what you realized was, oh, I have made a bunch of decisions, and I didn't realize I was making those decisions. Yes, exactly. Right. So I just make new decisions and change things up. And I think like about the awesome business you built and the fact that you created um, conferences and retreats and like you did a lot of, I don't know if you did that pre 30 or after 30, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but you did like a lot of cool things and you built something really awesome. It's just, and I feel like no matter how aware we try to be in our lives, every once in a while we'll wake up, we'll, we wake up and we're like, wait, like in my business, I feel like I just realized I woke up one day and I was like, this got really complex Yeah. and like, and like it's got branches everywhere. Like it's, it's like, it's not easy to understand for people. And it just kind of snowballed into that. Right. So once I realized it, it's like, okay, new decisions. I can re redo this. Right. And because I also think that, especially with business, like I was, um, not like picking goals that were actually the right goals. Like I was not realizing like that freedom and that adventureness and free spiritness and autonomy and community were like my highest priorities. And I was just thinking money, not in a greedy way, but like I, I have to support my family way. So money has to be my top priority. And then when you chase the money, you sometimes end up with a business that just is like, this is not the business I wanted. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's almost like, um, I feel like, uh, we, we did the episode about the desire map and yeah. core desire feelings, right? It's like realizing my metrics of my goals need to be what really matters to me. And right. I really try to stress this in map making, but I feel like it usually takes people, a couple times to realize, oh wait, I picked the wrong goal because you, you just start with like what you think you should start with. Right. And how many times I say like, pick, pick the metrics that matter to you. People are like, well, this is the metric that should matter to me. Exactly. Start measuring my success on this. And then they're like, I don't like it at all. Right. Right. <laughs> and so I think I did that with personal life as well. I think I picked the values of being a good mom and being a good wife and did all the actions to lead towards those things, which are good things, but forgot that like having an identity is really important to me. Like I need to feel like myself. Like I don't like when people put me into like a mom box or like an entrepreneur box. Like I want to be Jolie. I want to be Jolie who has thoughts and interests and like things and like I forgot that that was important, or never even knew because I took it for granted, like that that was important to me. And so when I was making all these choices of good mom and good wife and, you know, family first and all that, like, I just let it slip that like, oh, but what am I doing like for me? Like, I, I just forgot that that's something I need. Totally. And I think it's really common. Actually, it's almost exactly what, um, I have a friend who had four kids in five years and her youngest, um, well, she just turned six, but when she turned five, she told me like, we're talking about something. And she was like, motherhood, it's so easy to just totally lose your identity. And especially when there are that many babies in your yeah. house, like, just like, I just basically the youngest turned five, went to 
preschool or kindergarten. So for the first time ever, the house in the day for a couple hours didn't have kids. And she's like, I realized, what do I even care about? Like, what do I even want to do with my life? Like, what is even, and she had been having a business yeah. the whole time. Like she didn't, she wasn't not working on her own stuff. It's just, she didn't realize like what you just said, the identity part of like, okay, now who am I right. and what do I care about? And what do I even want to do with this business that I've just been like running in the background? Cause I thought, I mean, cause she loved the business and she needed the money, but it was just like going to a job without ever stopping to think, who am I? What's yeah. happening? Yeah. So I think that identity thing is, um, it's funny cause I have a friend that I, f- I feel like from the outside, she's going through it right now, um, with two really small young kids. And, uh, and I think in a couple years or I don't know, maybe sooner she'll be like, wait, I need to get back to the stuff I actually like. Yeah. And it seems like a natural, a natural kind of progression of having a tiny person with you that needs a hundred percent of your time and energy and body fluids. <laughs> yeah. You're like literally feeding this thing. So it seems like a natural kind of thing. It's just want to wake up and get out of it when it's time to. So the last part of the book that I really liked was she goes to, um, Israel and ends up talking with one of her like Orthodox Jewish friends, like female friends about like just that whole uh, culture and the things and they end up talking about like love and marriage and so she talks about how she was talking to her that her friend about this wanting to find love that's like this all-consuming feeling and her friend says if love is just a feeling and that feeling changes then what love has to be something you choose to build I just really liked that I was like oh that's kind of like a really nice it was sort of towards the end of the book and it was like this really nice wrap up of like this whole thing that she'd been going on like searching for love and searching for this feeling and then her friends like but if if it's just a feeling and it fades then what do you have like love has to be a choice yeah definitely I love that it's funny because that's what was I was thinking when you said she was like looking for this all-consuming love I was like well there's your problem yeah <laughs> Like that is, um, something we, Jay and I used to joke about my college roommates who were, um, single and definitely wanted to get married all through their twenties. And they both ended up meeting great guys by the time they're 30, but they, they felt like because they hadn't yet, it was never going to happen for them. And, but that's what they were looking for. We could, we would always joke that like what they wanted was like Cinderella and like so much better to like find somebody who would really enjoy their company and build a relationship than wait to be swept off your feet. Yeah. So that's really what my friends would tell me is like, well, he's really great. He's really nice. We have great fun together, but I'm just not like swept off my feet. Like I'm not like overwhelmed with like falling in love with him. I'm right. Like, well, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, that's just right. You have, it's a choice you make. Yeah. I mean, because after six months, I feel like it's a choice you make, let alone like 50 years. Right. Um, her friend talks about how, like the tradition of matchmaking and how like in, in her culture, uh, like the potential suitors would be highly vetted to make sure like they had, you know, a job and like prospects and were like financially stable and like a sound person. And she said when they met, the boy and the girl's job was to answer three questions, which were, do we want the same things out of life? Do we bring the best out of each other? And do we find each other attractive? And if all those three things were a yes, then it's a match and you get married. (laughs) And then you figure it out as you go. Right. Because really, I mean, you and I both um, got married really young and like, I don't even know if we answered, we were together for several years before we got married, but I don't even know if we answered those questions. <laughs> and no matter if you're like feeling super swoony in love or not, you, you still have to figure it out as you go. Right. <laughs> Well, yeah, all I knew was that I didn't really like other people and I liked Ian. And so that must be something to it. If this was a person I actually liked, never mind, could live with. <laughs> I like your standards. Uh, yeah, ours was we were both graduating and like moving away, right? And so I was like, well, we've been together three years. We super like each other. He's the best guy literally like I don't like a lot of men like just enjoy, like yeah as people. and so he's the best and it's either decide now or 
like death or break up. Right. Right. We're going to move. I'm not going to keep making my decision based on my college boyfriend and what he's doing. If I don't feel ready to spend the rest of my life with him, I was kind of intense. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, okay. And, uh, I mean, that doesn't sound as like, I was super in love and all like, he's the best person in the whole wide world. But also, yeah, it came down to, we're either going to make this work now or like, I'm good it's going to be all over. And the thought of it being all over was like horrible. Right. So, and not just like I would be sad, but I was like this, this kind of thing will never come along again, which of course is true also because I'm never going to be that young (laughs) and it's stupid again. (laughs) So like, like in all the ways. And so that was, yeah. So when people, when my friends would be like, Oh, I want what you and Jay have. It's so romantic. You love each other so much. I was like, yeah, but like, it's not like, you feel like that all the time. It's not like I felt like that the moment I met him. Like a lot of it is just a decision to be nice to each other, to show up for right. each other, to try to make each other better. <laughs> and it ends up with like lovey feelings, but that's just an outgrowth of like all that decision making. Yeah. I actually would have married Ian when I first met him. Like I'm trying to think that <laughs> to like when we like first met, if he had proposed, like I'm, I, there's a small part of me that's like, I might have actually said yes that date one. Yeah. Like I, like I think I just knew. But yeah, that was basically his proposal. He's a year older than me. And so he was graduating and he's like, everyone keeps asking me like what I want to do next. And he's like, all I know is I want to be with you. And so he proposed. I know. Isn't it sweet? <laughs> That's so sweet. I love it. Um, yeah, Jay, so Jay says he knew from day one and he like started telling me like immediately. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to get married at all. And I don't like, like, I just want to like do my own thing my whole life and not be tied down. You know, we were, I was a freshman in college. Yeah. And so, um, and I hadn't seen many healthy marriages at all. So I was like, this doesn't work for anyone. I don't know why anyone gets into it. And he was like, um, not like he was, uh, pursuing me. Like I like to spend time with him and I like to be with him, yeah. but he would also be like, I just know for sure you're it. Like, okay. And I just thought, like, I also kind of thought it was a line. Like, he, that's what I would, and I still tell him, like, I, I just think you were just, like, saying that because you thought I would like it. And he's like, no, I was really sure. And I'm like, how could you be sure? <laughs> you know, how is anybody sure? I always I think know. about when Harry met Sally, where the woman's like, you know, the way you know about a good melon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I say that to him all the time. You're a good melon. Yeah. You know. Yes. You just know. One of my favorite movies. So I bought the screenplay of it. You can buy it on like Amazon. And then I read it recently and I was like, I love it just as much as I love the movie. Like I actually don't need the whole movie. Like I just love word for word every part of it. Yes. It is oh, so good. That is my like, I'm sick. I'm going to watch when Harry Matt Sally. Same. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we're just talking about movies. <laughs> Um, so would you recommend the book? Yes. Um, as long as you don't mind drug references and like female promiscuity is then yes, I, I loved it. It was so good. It, I thought it was like just a really funny, enjoyable read. And so, yes, I would highly recommend it. Awesome. Yay. Well, I want to check it out. Uh, cause it sounds great and I love memoirs. Yes, you should. So yeah, so if you guys read the book or if you have thoughts, if you've read it in the past, uh, you can come over to our Facebook group. It's Take Care of Yourself with Tara and Jolie on Facebook. Uh, The link is in the description of this video, of this podcast, wherever you're listening or watching. Um, So come over there. Let us know what you think. Yeah, and next week uh, we're recording a kind of like a sequel episode where we go back and we talk about the books that we've read and things that we've learned since then or comments that you guys have made. So we want your comments and questions. If you have questions or comments about any of the books we've read so far, yes. come to the Facebook group and tell us. I'm going to do a post there you can comment on. And uh, we'll read your comments on air and and chat with uh, whatever, whatever you want us to revisit. And if you're not a Facebook person, you can find us on Instagram and leave a comment there as well. So we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye guys. Bye.